Hey friends, uh, this is Monaco here with our uh, fifth homework video. We are starting to get into actually how to name and write ionic compounds. Last video we saw how to apply oxidation states and this rule how the oxidation states in the compound have to add up to zero. We're going to take that rule and go to the next step today and start to learn about this IUPAC system of naming compounds. Now there's a million websites out there about to how to name compounds. I strongly suggest for your Easter egg is to find me a new website that shows me how to name ionic compounds and covalent compounds from the formulas and the names back and forth because I'm always looking for new resources to help people learn. Now after this video you should be able to using the IUPAC rules to name ionic compounds given their formulas and use those same set of rules to work from the formula back into the name. Okay, so it's kind of vice versa, back and forth, names to compounds, compounds to names. We're going formulas to names, form, names to formulas, back and forth, back and forth. So let's get to our lead in here. Well, what's so special about writing and naming ionic compounds? Well, it's kind of important for industry that uh, the name of a chemical compound is universal, right? It's also important for safety, too. So the system was created by the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists, IUPAC, to come up with some standard as to how the name game is played when it comes to chemistry. Because if you're talking to your factory in China making a product, you have to use words that they understand, and they have to use words that you understand. And I'm not too fluent in Mandarin or Cantonese myself, but I bet most chemists in, around the world speak the same chemical language. So that's why we have to have a special system for naming chemical compounds. You can see here in these examples that I've got here that there's a system. You know, we put one element first and the other element second. Sometimes there's Roman numerals and parentheses. These, far, these five examples are for transition metal salts, which make really awesome colored ions and solutions. So we'll see some of that firsthand ourselves later on. Here's our notes though. These are the naming rules according to the IUPAC, IUPAC. That's a universal way of naming compounds for the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. Okay, it's a governing body, it's a group that governments how to name things. Compounds have a common name and a chemical name. The common name is like potassium chloride or sodium chloride. The chemical name well, I, I should take it back. Common name is like table salt or sidewalk salt. The chemical name is like sodium chloride or calcium chloride. There's a systematic method for naming ionic compounds in their chemical names. So take a formula and go to a chemical name. You always name the positive element first, which is usually the metal. Okay, And we all take the name of the negative element second in the nonmetal. Okay, So if it's an ionic compound, it's always a metal plus a nonmetal or metal plus a polyatomic nonmetal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we replace the ending of the second word, the second element, with "-ide". So fluorine would become fluoride. Oxygen would become oxide because these are nonmetals. They would come second in the name, and we have to replace the end with "-ide". The "-ide shows that it's an ionic compound and it has an ionic charge itself. Okay. Now I'm going to do some examples here. Na Cl. So you name the first one first. The first, the positive ion comes first, and that's sodium. And then the hard part, you got to remember, you're going to do the nonmetal second, but you change the end to ide. So it's chlor ide. Okay. K2O. Well, K is potassium, and that's going to be positive charged potassium. And oxygen, but that's coming second, so we have to change it to oxide. Oxygide? No. Oxide. You're changing the suffix on the name to ide. Next one, and then I'm going to let uh, you try your hand at the other two for your practice here, for your homework, is calcium and bromine will turn to bromide, not bromiamide, brome Ide. So we're changing the suffix on the word to ide. Now you can also go backwards. Because the name and the formula are so closely related, we can work back backwards from the chemical name back to the formula. 
but we'll have to apply the oxidation state rule to get the formula right. Plenty of practice in class, so don't freak out if you don't get this right away. Lithium bromide. Well, lithium comes first, and bromine comes second. Now, I have to check my periodic table to see the selected oxidation states that are most common. Lithium is most commonly a plus one, and bromine is most commonly a negative one. So it's great. These two match up as it is. I don't have to change the subscripts at all. Sodium fluoride. Well, sodium is Na, and fluorine is fluoride, which is F. I uh, check out the selected oxidation states. I see sodium is usually a plus one, and fluorine is usually a minus one. That's great. I don't have to change the numbers of them because those easily cancel out to zero. Now, in magnesium chloride, magnesium is pretty simple, Mg. And chloride means chlorine. And check that out. Now, magnesium's oxidation state is a plus two. And chlorine's usually is a minus one. Now we have a situation where we say, oh gosh, I have a plus two on my magnesium and a minus one on my chlorine. That doesn't add up to zero. What do I do? Well, you have to add another chlorine. Because now you have a plus one times two. That's, I'm sorry, a minus one for a chlorine. Minus one times two for the chlorine makes a minus two and a plus two. So if you were to take these two numbers, now you have a neutral compound. Okay. So that's the name of the game there. That stuff's tricky. We're going to get the hang of it by doing it in class. Potassium iodide is the last one I'm going to do. Potassium is K. Iodine is I. And we're lucky in this respect because K has a plus one ion state, oxidation state, and, ion, and iodine is always a minus one. So for that reason, we don't have to change any subscripts. So this is the only one where we're starting to get a peek at the future as to where we're headed with this stuff. Now, polyatomic ions are named exactly as they're seen on table E. So you have to have your reference table E in order to do these things. And we just name them according to what the table tells us the name is. Pretty simple. We'll name the metal first, like we always do. And then we'll find the polyatomic ion and slap its name on. So the metal here is sodium, sodium, which means that this is the polyatomic ion there, the OH. Don't say sodium oxygen hydrogenide. No, because if you see three elements or more, you got to start looking at table E. So OH, in this case, is hydroxide. So sodium hydroxide. This stuff, common name, is, well, drain cleaner. Drain out. In the solid form, it's very nasty. So the next one, look in here, we see three different elements, so table E must be involved. K is first. K is the metal, so we'll call it potassium. It says its name. And then we're looking for the polyatomic ion, NO3, because we like to match. NO3, oh, nitrate. Nitrate. Potassium nitrate is a relative of sodium nitrate, which is what gives hot dogs their red type color and flavor and preservative qualities. Now, going back the other way, it's pretty straightforward, except we might have to apply the oxidation state rule to make a neutral compound. Let's try it, though. Ammonium hydroxide. So I'm looking at table E. I find the one called ammonium. Well, that's NH4. It says it's got a plus on it. Now, hydroxide, well, that's the OH negative. Well, a plus one and a minus one, those cancel out, so that's perfect. That's perfect. So we can write it without our ionic charges, NH4. I'm going to just color code it so you can see the two different polyatomic ions, OH. Now, calcium phosphate. Well, calcium, we know, is CA. Now, phosphate is PO4-3, PO4-3, negative, negative 3. And calcium's a plus 2. So this is one that's going to have to apply a little bit of hmm, logic to see how the plus 2 and the minus 3 can cancel. If you show me that proper compound formula, there's another Easter egg for you. Okay, just making a note so I know which one it was. Now, transition metals tend to have more than one oxidation number, so you must do a Roman numeral in there to indicate 
their oxidation number within a compound. Roman numeral appears in parentheses after the element symbol in the stock system. For cobalt chloride, it could have a formula of COCl2 or COCl3, depending, since cobalt could have an oxidation number of 2 or 3. See those two options? So you have to specify which one it is. So COCl2 would be named, well, we have a COCl is always negative 1, so negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. We need a positive 2 to cancel that, so positive 2 here. So this is cobalt 2 chloride, so cobalt, Roman numeral 2, chloride. That's for the transition metals that have multiple oxidation states. Now this one, negative 1, is always for the halogens. Negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. So we have to have some number times 1 is positive 3. So that's a positive 3 there. So cobalt's other option is a positive. So this particular scenario, we have cobalt, Roman numeral 3, chloride. And that, again, is just telling you the difference between which oxidation state and, therefore, what formula the compound makes. And, yes, it does matter because cobalt 2 chloride is completely different than cobalt 3 chloride in how it reacts, how it looks, maybe even different color stuff. Some one of them might kill you. The other one might save you. Who knows? You've got to be specific in chemistry. So writing formulas for particular compounds. Zinc oxide. Well, zinc is Zn. And it's got a plus 2 oxidation state as its only option. And oxygen is O. And it's got a minus 2 oxidation state as its only option. So the formula, therefore, is ZnO. Simple stuff. Working this way, we've got iron, Roman numeral 2, chloride. Iron, well, that's Fe. The Roman numeral 2 tells you that it's a plus 2. And the chloride, Cl, is always going to be a negative 1. So now we have to figure out what combination of iron and chlorine here is going to make a neutral compound. Well, if I've got a plus 2 on my iron and a negative 1 on my chlorine, I bet you I need Fe and 2 Cls to make a neutral compound. Mercury, 1, sulfur. Mercury is Hg. And since they gave us the courtesy of telling us it's a plus 1, we can go with that one. And sulfur sulfide is S, but it's a negative 2. So let's think. How can we combine a plus 1 and a minus 2? We're going to have to double up on one of these elements. It's going to be the HG. HG 2 S. That is a neutral compound, ionic compound with a transition metal. Getting close to the end here. Actually, there it is. This is complex stuff. And only thing that is going to be the remedy for your misunderstanding, if you have one, is repeating the process over and over and over. So practice, 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 practice. Writing and naming the ionic compounds using the IUPAC process is not easy. You've got to remember to change the nonmetal name to I and place Roman numerals for oxidation states of transition metals in those ionics. And I guess the other thing you've got to know is that all compounds must be neutral. must be neutral, not have an ionic charge. So relevant practice pack pages, there's a bunch of them, about four or five practice pack pages in our unit kit. So this stuff is important. Remember, I want to see a website that helps you understand this IUPAC system, stock system process, and tell me what the formula for calcium phosphate is. Show me on paper how it's done, and those are your Easter eggs for this video. Thanks for watching.